verbatim notes because we do have those video uh, YouTubes of all the lectures. So all the diagrams, uh, all of the, uh, can you cut this to presentation please? All of the equations, everything is in YouTube. So you don't, you can take quick bare bones notes and then uh, they'd go fill it in and it's a very good study technique matter of fact the person that became an ace at that is over here on the left side of the lectern Miss Darian uh, that's one of her favorite study techniques okay month of March another month I changed to a new quote of the month or quote of the day this month it's gonna be Will Rogers Famous uh, commentator, comedian type guy, uh, was always making fun of Congress. Um, he's about 80 years ago that he was, he was uh, operating. Uh, now, I want to make a mention of the target list from Lecture 2. We went over in Lecture 2 um, some of the brain burners that we were going to encounter. We've already encountered a few of them. This is the one uh, that uh, we've been talking about in detail lately. And we've even used this diagram on homework. Um, and so um, we're in the middle of it. We're in the thick of it. Now we've got a bunch of brain burners ahead of us, so uh, we've got to work our you-know-what off. Um, but for the next month or so, uh, but that's all right. There's no law against hard work, and we'll be doing it. Now, what we're going to be doing today from this target list, um, we're going to be working on stopping time and stopping distance problems. We're just going to go through those brain burners from homework 10, and it's just step by step. And, and if you've already racked up the dineros from homework 10, uh, work it out with me again today because it's probably different than what you have done and it will reinforce, John, um, what you need to do. And the thing that you want to remember is if you, if you are presented with a stopping time or a stopping distance problem on the midterm or the final exam, um, you want to be able to do it quickly. And so just doing a couple is all right. But really, really thinking your way through and working hard now will make you swift and sure on the midterm, which is what you want to do. All right, now here's what the mega practice homework, uh, here's the intro to it. And I gave you some tips. Remember to use the impulse formula, remember to use the stopping distance or the work formula. By the way, I'm going to give you an extension on this homework and I'm going to give you two. I just saw somebody up front here go, yay. That's good. I'm going to give you another two attempts as well. All right, so I'll extend it until Thursday morning. Now, why am I going to do that? Well, I'm... Shh, shh, shh. I ain't just whistling Dixie. It ain't just a coincidence that I'm really emphasizing all the way up to exam two, the day of, uh, these two problems. It's not a coincidence. All right? So, good. Now that you're properly... Instructed. Now, uh, one of the ones I want to comment briefly about is question 10. There were some uh, discussions in question 10. Uh, how do we... And as Arnold says, I have detailed files. And the reason that we have detailed files is from Haley. And what Haley did was post a question. And I have responded to her question in uh, that discussion and because of that there's some good guidance for you on that 
And it's pretty basic. It's not a difficult question um, once you get the concept. And so I'll just invite you to look at Haley's discussion uh, thread entitled HW10. All right, so make a note of that for your stuff. Uh, if, if you got befuddled by that, if you want to do some extra study, as always, go and look at what I say about it, especially. You know, your classmates, you know, might be giving you this or that, or, but if, if I'm in there commenting, yeah, that's something that's worth looking at. These are the two that we're going to look at. Now, what I did this morning before lecture, I did the quiz myself, the homework assignment. I did a uh, preview of it. And so I have this version of question 12. The numbers change each time. The initial velocity, I believe, is one of the uh, variables in both of these problems. Remember, when you have a, a calculation question in which you type into the answer box a number, it's going to change at least one of the uh, question values, you know, maybe the initial velocity, maybe the mass, maybe more than one uh, for every attempt. Right? So this is my attempt this morning. You might not have had 4.8, you might have had 5.3 for this, uh, this uh, Chuck Norris eyeglasses problem. All right? But what we do with 4.8, what we do down here with a 40 kilogram little kid at 4.5 meters per second, that strategy will apply no matter what the variables are. All right, so be aware of that. Let's tackle question 12. And you know what we're going to do? We're just going to, uh oh. What did we do last time? What did I do? All right, let me pause the podcast. Okay, here we go. What we're going to do is go through this particular problem, this instance of uh, the stopping time. And let's just point that out first. Let me get this up out of the way here. Uh, first thing to, to do is look at your task. Is it stopping time or stopping distance? Because the nature of the task indicates which formula you probably want to use. And so for this... You know, this one, we probably want to use impulse. Our target in this equation is delta t, this, which for us will be a stopping time. It doesn't have to be a stopping time, but for us, I've styled this problem as a stopping time problem. Now, you can use the impulse equation if you're studying the momentum state of the moon on its orbit, and that has no stopping time. It's in continuous motion, on its elliptical orbit. It's a difficult problem, but astronomers and scientists have been doing it a lot. Uh, but for us, it's a stopping time problem. Another thing in here, and this caused a little bit of um, mental disaster for some of you, is that it starts out with a mass in grams. Now, as I mentioned in discussions, and I'll repeat now, uh, most of the time, I'll give you a mass in kilograms if I'm working with meters, seconds, newtons, joules, and stuff like that. But occasionally, I feel okay about giving you a mass in grams if it's something small, like a coin or like a pair of sunglasses. Now, if I have a person, um, the normal scale for a human is kilograms, but for something small like this, grams is better. But all you got to do is convert it. Here's your conversion factor. Uh, one point, let me get my, there we go. 1.00 grams is the same as 0 0.001 kilograms. So 95 grams is the same as 0 0.095 kilograms. 
All right. Now, the other thing that we're going to do in this problem is we're going to use the minus sign to indicate directionality leftward, uh, and we're going to apply it consistently. Now, this is a departure from what I saw from some of you in discussions. FTP. FT equals P is something that I saw. Yeah, that's nice, but what if I ask you a question in which um, I want to have a direction? Or you have to figure out the direction and then figure out delta P. You better know your minus signs and your plus signs. So we're going to do it today. All right, let's get down to the specs. All right, for this particular problem, we have a mass of 0 0.095. Initial condition, um, VI equals 4.8 meters per second. And for um, bookkeeping purposes, let's call that a rightward velocity. So this uh, pair of sunglasses is going in this direction initially and then it comes to a stop. Now the conditions on this system are the following. There is friction opposite to the direction of the initial velocity. All right, so for that reason, it gets a negative 0.08 newtons, i.e. leftward. Now, it's possible to work out this problem without minus signs, but on the midterm you might find that if you don't know how to handle these minus signs like this, uh, you're going to be all discombobulated. And that is not what you want to be on a midterm or at any time. All right, momenta. Let's get, let's start putting it together. We're just going to go step by step and put it all together. You know, this is the stuff right here. This is kind of my list of information from the problem itself. All right, let's start applying that information. Let's get the momentum states. All right, initial momentum, 0 0.095 kilograms times 4.8 meters per second. And that works out to four, 0 0.456 kilogram meter per second. Now, the final momentum state is pretty easy because it's a stopping time problem. So... P subscript F is zero, goose egg time. All right, so that one's easy. And what that is nice uh, about, what makes that handy and convenient is that delta P is fairly simple to calculate. Zero minus PI. And so... P subscript I is positive 0 0.456 kilogram meters per second. So delta P is um, negative 0 0.456 kilogram meter per second. All right. Now, I'm going to ask you to make a note over here back in item 2B of my outline. And what I want you to make a note of is that a Newton is the same as a kilogram meter per second squared. And the reason that I'm pointing that out is because we're going to do some cancelizations in just a second. All right, so here's my impulse equation. Now, I've got my friction force over here. This is the F delta T part of the equation on the left. You don't have to write it on the left if you don't want. I mean, left or right is fine. Uh, and here's my delta P that we just calculated. And notice that I have negative signs on both sides of the equation. So you can definitely cancel those babies if you like. Um, also, you have kilograms on both sides. And you have meters on both sides in the numerator. In the denominator, you have a second squared here and a second to the first power here. So this guy can be canceled out on the right side, but you can only cancel out one factor of seconds over here. And that's all right, because we want an answer in seconds, and this is the only unit that survives. 
Here's my quotient, delta T is equal to this monstrosity, and you may have already canceled some stuff. You may just have 0 0.456 divided by 0 0.08, and then seconds in the denominator. And you can, so you can do your canceling here at this second stage, or you could do it up here, you know, at the first level of this equation. Either way, six of one, half dozen of another, whatever your, you know, whenever you see it. I mean, you cancel whenever you see something. Sometimes you don't see it until you change your, your newtons into kilogram meters per second squared. But when you do, um, you can cancel out quite a bit of stuff because your answer is fairly simple, 5.7 seconds. Anybody verify me on that? Did you check? You get that? All right. Raise your hand if you verified me on that. You guys should all be good. You should, you have, you should have your calculator out because you're going to have a question like this in just a few minutes. And always have it ready to verify me in class. And I'll, I'll try to always be accurate every once in a while. You know, like the other day I had an extra zero in there and somebody nabbed me on it. Okay. You are deputized to nab me at any time for your legal procedure. You can stop me and say, Dr. B, that's a, that's a penalty flag, five yards, illegal procedure, you forgot a zero, or whatever it is I did. So, and it's, sometimes I do that if I'm rushing. Because yeah, I'm, I'm looking here at my computer screen, and I'm also looking over my shoulder, and I'm looking at you, so it's kind of, I, I get confused easily. Anyway, so this is the answer. Now let me pause for questions on this stopping time question, stopping time problem. Question. Uh -oh. Oh, there's a spider over there? Yes. Oh, my goodness. Well, let's just cancel class. <laughs> it's right there from the <gasps> okay, who's going to be the brave, brave heart and go and get... So, ooh, bare hands it. Nice. Arnold-like. All right, anyways, a serious question. Shh. Hey, the, the spider's dead. It's, it's to Dude, come on. Let's focus on this. <laughs> um, serious question about the impulse time, impulse stopping time problem. Yeah, Sava. Sava just made a mistake in his question. He said, you know how sometimes friction works opposite the velocity and sometimes it works with it? That is incorrect. It never works with the velocity. Friction is always opposite. <coughs> Bet on it. That is how it works. It's always impeding. It's never, you're never going to boost your velocity with friction. You're only going to dissipate kinetic energy with friction. So, all right? So Sava said, all right, in terms of direction, if you're going downward, then would friction be, oh. Would friction be upward? This is, and that is correct, but we just lost the display again. Uh, it, is it? All right. Okay, so much for that, and now we've, we're, we're at problem, uh, the next problem. Um, but to answer your question, Sava, if, if you're going downward, yeah, air, free, air resistance is upward. You know, just think of how a parachute works. You know, the parachute gets pulled by air resistance above you. Not, it doesn't go below you, right? All right, here's the second problem. 
uh, you observe a, a video of a little kid, you observe a video of a little kid take a spill and slide to a stop at the skating rink, etc., etc. Now, this is my attempt from this morning. And again, um, the first thing to notice is what your task is. And in this case, the task is stopping distance. And that means that you probably want to use the work formula if you can. And here's the work formula. The change in the kinetic energy, that's the definition of work, and then that's equal to F parallel times delta X. Now, in discussions this morning, before class, I typed in some answers to students' question. Uh, Dr. B, what is this F parallel business? And I said, it's the component of the net force acting on the object that is parallel to the trajectory. And that means it's parallel to the velocity. And when they're parallel, they speed up. If it's anti-parallel, it would slow it down. The other component of the net force would be the perpendicular, perpendicular to the trajectory. Because it's perpendicular to the trajectory, no matter what the trajectory is, it's perpendicular to the velocity. Because it's perpendicular to the velocity, that makes it centripetal, a centripetal force. And the centripetal force never adds any speed. It only changes direction left or right. All right, so that is why the kinetic energy, which encodes V squared dynamically, the sp square of the speed, uh, only involves this component, F parallel. All right, let's trot through the specs for this baby. And this is, again, a process that if you can try to remember this process and follow it, you'll be looking good. Question? Uh, Morgan. Yeah. Oh, well, this is the... Morgan just asked me, what is F parallel delta S? The letter S for Sierra. Uh, that's the generic version of the work formula. This one's particular because we're on a horizontal surface, so the little shrimpy kid is sliding along the x-axis. But if, like Sava was saying, um, uh, it was something in free fall, then you'd want to use delta Y for vertical motion. Delta S in the formula, that's the most generic form of it, um, and it can represent any spatial direction. Okay? Uh, Lana. Alana's asking me about cats. And there's more than one there's more than one way to skin a cat. And Alana's saying, can you use F equals MA to get acceleration and delta T? And the answer to that is yes. That's the long way. But if that's the way you like, fine. Uh, we're going to use the, the work formula. All right, so the specs. Remember, I can hear you when you're talking up here. It's really distracting even for me, and it's going to be distracting to your classmates. 40 kilograms for this shrimpy little kid in this instance, and his initial speed when he takes a face plant is 4.5 meters per second. And again, let's call this one right work. You know, we're not... We're not launching a, a rocket to the moon, Sava, so we don't, we'll just, just stay horizontal here. That's good. Keep it basic. And once you get your A in physical science, 1121, we can sign you up for NASA. Send you down to Houston. Conditions. Friction opposite the direction of the initial velocity as before, but this time it's a little bit bigger. It's, and we're going to call it leftward, so it gets a minus sign. In this example, it's negative 20.3. Now, again, on this one, I am using the minus sign to indicate directionality, and 
there is no there is no directionality to the kinetic energy and so in the delta kinetic energy you're just going to have a difference of two positive numbers now in momentum you might have subtraction of a negative in, if you know if you're Initial velocity is leftward or something like that. But for this one, it's fairly easy. So let's get the kinetic energies for the delta Ke part. That's my dynamic uh, quantity. I want to find delta of this dynamic quantity. All right. So kinetic energy initial, 1 half mv squared. Okay, here's my 1 half, 0 0.5. Here's m, 40 kilograms. And here's 4.5 meters per second, and I've got to square it. And when you square that, see if you can verify me, uh, 405 joules. Anybody verify? Okay, good. Got it? All right. Good. All right. Now, the second kinetic energy is uh, fairly easy again. It's a stopping problem. And hey, you guys, notice that instead of writing it down as 0.0, .0 joules, which is certainly fine, I've written it down as 0.0, .0 newton meters. Why? Because I know that I'm going to do some canceling in just a minute. All right. And I have a, I have a force over here. I have F parallel. That's going to be my friction force. So it's not going to be very mysterious. I want to cancel some Newtons on the left and some Newtons on the right and get some meters. And this is, if I work in, if I work in Newton meters, I'll be able to do that. So here's my delta Ke, 0 minus 405. All right, so my work formula now is negative 405 newton meters, and now I've converted from joules to newton meters, straight across. It's just another name for a joule. And that's equal to negative 203. Uh-oh. No wonder. See? Dr. B. Uh, put in a 20. This is going to change the answer. This should be 20.3 instead of 203. Yeah, and this is supposed to Dr. B. Wow, I missed, I left something out and I put something in that, man, I got to give myself, I'll change, I'll fix it on the podcast. So this should be negative 20.3. So the answer is going to be the quotient of 405 newton meters divided by 20.3 newtons and that works out to what 19.95 something like that is that what you get okay 405 divided by 20.3 uh, and so that's about 20 meters so this thing so that little kid slides the length of this room is pretty nice. He's probably having a nice, probably thinking, man, this is nice. He's getting it right. Um, now, questions about this problem. Okay, I see a bunch of questions. Number one. Um, is friction always the opposite of initial velocity direction? The question up here, Sava, was... Is friction always. always opposite the direction of the velocity? Saba, what's the answer to that? Yes. All right. Question. Yeah, 19.95. So that one, I asked you to round it to the nearest, uh, no, I think I asked to the nearest 0.1 meter on that one. So that would be 20. Uh, 20.0, yeah, on that one. But, you know, if I, if I do ask you on the test, I'll just give you guys a little hint here. On tests, 
you've got one calculation. I have no control over the, the values that they put in on these calculation problems in Canvas. They just put the numbers in, and, and sometimes it's hard to figure out how to round it. You're never going to have that problem on a test. I'm never going to give you an answer where the digit that you decide to round with is a 5. I'm always going to give you something below a 5 or above a 5, never a 5. So don't worry about that. Another question. Go ahead. You mean right here? Uh, let me get my cursor. You mean right here? Yeah, that was a typo. That was Dr. B getting distracted. There was a, you know, there was some, some interesting. I, I sit out here for about two and a half hours every Tuesday and Thursday morning, getting ready for lecture. It's very interesting some of the things you see. So. I probably got to, so this is supposed to be negative 20.3 newtons. Okay, not I'll check, yeah, not newton meters. Over here, newton meters, yes. Over here, no. Okay, so that's a typo, and I will change that on the, on the YouTube before I publish the YouTube. Another question, over here. The question is, when do you use the distance triangle? You mean like the first time we did this kind of brain burner? You can use it here. It's got a lot more steps. Okay, so if you do it like, like we did, I think, last Tuesday, then, yeah, you can do that. But this is a little bit better way to look at it. It'll get you the same answer if you use it carefully. All right. Another question. Uh, name. Gabriella. Yeah, that's for a specific instance of work on a free fall trajectory. Okay. And we're probably going to talk about that uh, in a minute. Another question. Okay. Uh, let's go to the next task, and the next task is to calculate a stopping distance. And we are on frequency BB. Let's see if you can do it. And are you going to try to use a distance triangle? What's your name again? Jordan. Jordan. It is. Do you know how to use it now? Yeah, yeah. All right. All right. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it, it might not be bad to check your, you know, to just like totally, yeah, do it both methods and see if you get the same answer. Then you really know what you're doing. Yeah. All right, go ahead and work on this. And it's okay to talk with your neighbors.
Wait. so fast. <laughs> yeah. I bet Dar Darren, do you type fast too? Look at, look at that. That's like, I'm such a slow typist. Well, what do you think I grew up in the 1890s or something before <laughs> typewriters? We had typewriters when I was I just never learned that. Huh? Yeah, but I never, well, <laughs> even on a typewriter, I'm slow. I mean, and, you know, there were kids when I was in high school and whatnot. They learned typing. I mean, they had classes and things. Oh, so you, we didn't learn, I didn't learn typing. You could, you could take, I remember, yeah. Like, make us, like, teach us how to actually do it correctly. And, like, oh, yeah, hands, I didn't know. Because I've done it so much. I tried learning how to touch type, but... Just never worked out. One of those things, you know, two ships passing in the night. Yep. The romance of typing. <laughs> oh, Lord. Let's see what these guys are doing. Ooh, nice. Looks like we got a lot of people kicking it. And that's exactly what I want on Thursday. I want you guys kicking. You know what? Just like Chuck Norris. Roundhouse kick to exam two. Yeah. Let me see your clicker. Bring it up here. Come on around here. Oh, that's probably it. But I still get to go Nitro message. You do? Yeah. Yeah, you're on. Yeah, I'm in all my web courses, like, for all the ones that I, uh, it says, it's not even giving me zeros, it's just saying negative, like, not even attempted. <coughs> Text me your... Uh, or not text me, but in, in uh, web courses, send me this uh, serial number, and I'll double-check it against my roster. Okay. okay. Got to get this ready for the test. Yeah. So, yeah. Keep it. Keep the digits until the very last stage. Okay, one minute. Gabriella, are you going to the study group? Have you been to any study groups or anything? It's always good. Yeah, Megan's got one going, and Melanie's got one back there. All you got to do is make a friend. Make a friend in class. Twenty seconds. Darian, did you watch The Voice last night? Oh my goodness! They had this one uh, young woman on there. Oh man, she really hit it. Blue Bayou, Linda Ronstadt.
you know, from 70s. Oh man, she because that's a hard song to sing, you know, especially the last night, the last note. She's really got to get. I can't get it. She's really got to get up there and get it. And she, man, she nailed it. And Christine Aguilera was was going crazy. Uh, it was funny. I hardly ever watched that show. But. All right, ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Zero. Uh oh. Can you do my presentation, Mo, please? We got some splaining to do. Look at that. Oh, you. Oh, you want me to scroll down? It won't scroll. Here we go. Right, here we go. See, the thing is, I can't scroll over my shoulder for beans. Oh, look at that. Good. All right. If you had to answer 1.8, you're on the money. And you may think you are ready for the midterm on Thursday. But all I will say is... My admonition to all of you, for those who have ears to hear, my words of wisdom are, expect the unexpected. Do not sit on your laurels. Do not sit on, any, well, you can sit on your normal stuff, but uh, do not get overconfident. But I'm happy everybody, or a lot of people, got that one. All right, let's talk about the space shuttle. This is a picture of STS-119, about six years ago, seven years ago now. They took a, they had a, a plane, an Air Force plane, way high up at 30,000 feet or so, photographing the space shuttle as it came in. This is a false color infrared image. It was traveling at about 7,000 miles per hour, Mach 9.1, way up there at an altitude of about 50 kilometers. So it was way up there. All right. And the distance from the aircraft, 28.2 nautical miles. Now that's a... That's nothing for something like the Hubble Space Telescope. But, I mean, you know, uh, the Hubble Space Telescope could probably photograph the veins in your eye, probably the, the, the pieces of retina in, in the back of your eye for 28 miles. Uh, but this uh, airplane that took the photograph was moving in a jet through turbulence. And they got this photo. So now what we're going to do is analyze this in terms of potential energy and in terms of kinetic energy. All right, so let's, let's uh, take a reentry calculation. So what we're going to do is go from an altitude of 50 kilometers where you're moving at Mach 9.1, and then we're going to go down 50 kilometers to the landing strip at Kennedy Space Flight Center uh, at y equals zero and we're going to have a re-entry um, speed of 100 miles an hour for the space shuttle, or a, excuse me, a landing speed. All right, so here's some specs. The mass of the STS is about 100 metric tons. It's incredible. Landing speed, okay, let's use this, 215 that's about 100 meters per second. That's what I was thinking about, 100 meters per second. 250 miles an hour, that is pretty fast for a landing speed. But it's a really long landing strip, and they have chutes. They have parachutes that trail out the back to slow it down. All right? So we'll use that for our, our rough uh, number. Now, it takes 12 minutes for this to happen. All right, and so they're burning off a lot of joules of energy. 
That's about 700. So when they, so from the moment of that snapshot, it was already hot. It, it was coming in from about 200 miles altitude. And at that point, it was at about uh, 50 miles altitude. All right. And, no, that can't be right. What did I say it was? 160,000 feet. That's about 50 kilometers. Is that what I said? Okay, 50. So 50 kilometers, that's about 30 miles. Okay. And so anyways, uh, so, so it's coming down and from that altitude, another 12 minutes, it still has a lot of kinetic energy to dissipate. And that's what we're going to try to uh, figure out. First of all, how much energy is dissipated and how quickly is it dissipated? All right. So let's, um, you know, uh, take uh, a look at the space shuttle. This is the reentry attitude. It kind of goes in to the atmosphere like a belly flop. And the reason for that is so it catches a lot of air, dissipates a lot of heat as quickly as possible. All right, so let's figure out kinetic energy and GPE. Now, GPE is going to be mg times the altitude. Actually, mg times the radius from the center of the Earth. And I'll give you that in just a second. So mass, uh, 100,000 kilograms, that's 100 metric tons, roughly. And Mach 9.1 is about 3,130 meters per second. So that's about three kilometers a second. Whoa. One mile a minute is 60 miles an hour in a car. Right? This is three kilometers, it's like two miles per second. So it's really jamming. Right now, delta Y is the change in the altitude, about 50,000 meters. And notice I've gone from kilometers to meters. Okay, that's another thing you want to always, I'm, I'm going to always try to either state, use grams, or, you know, like in a thermodynamic problem, we do the grams a lot. But always, I'm going to try to, almost always give you your data in, gram, in kilograms, meters, and seconds, okay? So this is what we got. Now, kinetic energy, one-half mv squared. Um, GPE is mg times delta y. Okay, that's the energy that you store as, you know, on the way up when they, when they got the, you know, they burned those rockets... It took all the energy of those big booster rockets to get them up this high, and in fact, all the way up to orbit. Okay, so we're now burning, we're, we're recovering some of that uh, potential energy, mg delta y, and it's going to convert into kinetic energy if we don't try to slow down with friction in the atmosphere. But that's what the space shuttle does. It loses a lot of energy through friction. Okay, so this is very similar to f delta y, the work. The total energy, this is a conserved quantity. The total energy is uh, kinetic energy plus GPE. The symbol for that is capital E, total mechanical energy. Um, and this is what has to be dissipated almost to zero. Now, it's not going to go completely to zero because it's going to be landing with some kinetic energy, 100 meters per second worth of kinetic energy. But that's not a very big uh, amount compared to what it has up here. It's really got a lot of kinetic energy up here. And right, we're going to calculate that. And we're going to dissipate it through various braking methods. You know, one of their braking methods, you know, the longer, you know, I just thought of this. They, when they first landed the space shuttle, from, you know, they didn't take any payload. The first couple missions, they just flew it. They launched into space took a couple laps around the Earth, and then tried to land it, and they landed it successfully. And I'll never forget reading about it some years later, that those guys were making S-turns across the Pacific. So they, they, they de-orbit somewhere over the Indian Ocean, right? And so they come around the, the bottom of India and up into the Pacific, and they do like two S-turns. They go like this, and then like this. 
And by the time they're done with it, they're in Hawaii. And it's only a few minutes. And the reason they do that is to increase the delta S, the amount of distance that they're experiencing friction. Instead of going straight to Hawaii, yeah, they could do that. But if they, it's a plane. It's an airplane. You can steer it. You know, the, the Apollo capsule, when it was re-entered, you know, most, you know, the Soyuz capsule, when they come back in, you don't steer them. You just you sit there and hope you're aimed at the right point. The space shuttle, you could steer through re-entry. Oh, my goodness. What an experience that must be. And they would steer it across the Pacific doing these S-turns. The more distance they could build into the S, the more F delta S they could dissipate. All right? So, yeah, we're going to dissipate a lot of heat and energy. All right, let's do kinetic energy. We've got all the specs here. Uh, one half times 100,000 kilograms times 3130 meters per second quantity squared. Oh my goodness. That's a lot of joules. 0 0.5 times 100,000 and 3130, if you square that, verify me if you can, 9,796,900,000 meters squared per second squared. Anybody verify me on that? 3130 squared. Okay, got it? All right. Anybody else? All right. Make sure you try to verify and follow along on your calculator if you can. All right. Now, if you, now we're going to go into scientific notation because we're running out of space to draw all these zeros and stuff here. All right. So 0 0.5 times 100,000 times this monster, 9,796,900, is equal to 489.8 times 10 to the 9 kilogram meter squared per second squared. All right, now on your calculator, you probably will get 4.898 times 10 to the 11. Anybody get that? All right, if you got 10 to the 11, that's equivalent to this. And the reason I switched it from 4.898 times 10 to the 11 to 489.8 times 10 to the 9 is because 10 to the 9 is a billion, all right? So this kinetic energy is 489.8 uh, billion joules. And I'm going to round that off to 490. So there's my kinetic energy, 490 billion joules. Whoa. Now we got some uh, potential energy as well. Now, the potential energy is the additional kinetic energy it would gain if it didn't account, all the way down to Kennedy, if it didn't uh, burn, burn off energy with friction. Okay? So we've got to take that into account. So let's figure out the, G, the uh, GPE. And again, this one is very simple to calculate. It's M times G times the amount of distance it still has to lose. It's losing altitude. It's trading altitude for speed. So if there were no air friction, this is how much additional kinetic energy it would gain by the time it gets down to Kennedy. All right, it's 100,000 kilograms times good old 9.8 times 50,000 meters. Whoa. And again, we're talking some serious, serious dineros. All right, and we're going to move around some zeros. This is the same as 1 times 9.8 times 5 times 10 to the 9 kilogram meters squared per second squared. So again, we're talking billions of joules. This is a billion here, 10 to the 9. And kilogram meters squared per second squared, that's another, uh, that's joules. All right, so this is 49 billion joules, all right? So when that Air Force plane snapped that infrared image, false color, it had 490 billion joules of kinetic, and it still had 49 billion possible to gain 
if it doesn't dissipate it as heat. Now, you can work out this last one. On the landing strip, it's going to be 100 meters per second, and that's half a billion joules. So you've got to dissipate, and, and here's the calculation for that. Um, this is the landing speed at the, at, you know, the shuttle landing facility. Uh, 0.5 times the mass, 100,000 times landing speed, roughly 100 meters per second, quantity squared, and that works out to half a billion. So for the, when you're talking about the space shuttle landing, you're talking uh, energy in the order of joule, megajoules, or excuse me, gigajoules, billions of joules, or hundreds of gigajoules. You know, and it's a lot of energy. Billions and billions of joules. Now, all right, so this is a total of 539. And we want to dissipate that. Oh, 720 seconds. Oh, man. Whoo! That's a lot of joules to drop. Now, how can I tell that? How, how can I say that? Well, let's, let's figure this out. Okay, it's going to lo lose, of that 539, it's going to lose almost all of it. It needs a half a joule for landing. So here's the energy dissipation rate. Go ahead and make a note of that. This is the energy dissipation rate. And oh my goodness, that works out to 0 0.748 billion joules per second. Now, an energy dissipation rate is also known as power. The units of power are in the metric system are watts. 0 0.748 billion watts. Or, if you're thinking about time travel... 0 0.748 gigawatts, or as they say in the movies, gigawatts, all right? And you need 1.21 gigawatts to operate the flux capacitor. To land the space shuttle, you got to dissipate at this rate. Oh. The biggest thing you have in your house is probably your air conditioner, and that uses a lot of watts. That's where most of your power bill is, if you, if you own a house. Now, if you're in an apartment, it might not be uh, so bad. But that is a lot of... You, you don't have any appliance this big. You don't have anything that's in the megawatt range. You may have stuff in the kilowatt range. You know, like a hair dryer is a couple kilowatts, a couple thousand, 1,750, but not like this. All right, so what is a gigawatt? You might ask yourself that question. All right, a gigawatt is a unit of power, and the biggest dam we have in the United States, Grand Coulee, produces at full power when everything's running. 6.809 gigawatts when it's it's uh, when this lake is at its full capacity and they're running all the turbines down here in the powerhouse and my wonderful students that is you know about eight or nine times bigger than what the space shuttle has to dissipate so the energy that the space shuttle, so think about that. The energy that the space shuttle has to dissipate would light, 6.809 gigawatts lights up half the West Coast, you know, a good fraction of the West Coast, all right? And that's the amount of energy that the space shuttle has to dissipate for a couple minutes, 12 minutes or so. That's the energy dissipation rate equal to the energy that you can light up a good fraction of the West Coast. Now, here's the other part of that. Think about this. 
it if if it's if it's on top of the the uh, launch facility at Kennedy before it goes up, it has zero kinetic energy. All of that energy that it dissipates on the way down was originally in the fuel of those fuel tanks in the solid rocket booster and the liquid fuel rocket that power the main engines. That is a lot of energy. I don't know, you guys don't see very impressed by it, but I'm impressed by it. <laughs> One day, you too shall be impressed by the space shuttle. All right, that's all I have for today. Your homework is to get ready for exam two. You're dismissed. I'll see you on Thursday. Be ready and expect the unexpected.